First of all, I just have to thank you both for coming all these years later to have this conversation. So by all these years, I mean 32 years since it first came out. Really? And 34 years wow. since we shot it in wow. Reno. That's a long time ago. When you came on board for Desert Hearts, Janine, I saw Tender Mercies. Bruce Barris of its oh, really And so that's what really, really attracted me to you and your vision and your work and all that. So reeling back to the beginning, what do you recall about your beginnings with the project? I remember reading the script and I remember going to talk with you about it and I came away thinking, Don is a wonderful, smart, funny, committed person and there seems to be absolutely no reason why I shouldn't do this with her. It would be really a smart and fun project. And of course, you know, I was the right price and the right level of inexperience and didn't know what I didn't know, and so go right ahead and do it. Joining the, joining the group here. Yeah. I felt the same way when I read it and met you, and I thought, my God, this is like a real, it's kind of, bef it's, it's kind of before the sort of rise of the independent cinema, and I think a small movie like that would never be made because of the subject matter, it would never be made as a studio film, but it was just the right scale for the same reasons. And my inexperience, my lack of knowledge, my, my incompetence, it, it, it fit me perfectly. Mm -hmm. And of course, I love meeting you and talking to you about the whole thing, and, and the story was just magnificent. You said to me that I want to make a film about a relationship between two women that doesn't end tragically. That's an honest story. And I read the book, uh, Desert of the Hearts, mm -hmm. after I read your script, and I came away thinking, my God, I'll be very lucky. If I, if I get to work on this, and people will see this film, and if I do a halfway decent job, I'll, maybe I'll get another job. <laughs> and I guess you did. I mean, look at all the films that you have made. Bridges, Bridges of Madison, Madison County, County, LA Confidential, Catch Me If You Can, Sea Biscuit. And what about you, Robert? Boogie Nights, uh, Mission Impossible. So I kind of lost my virginity with both of you. And the reason I say that is because prior to that time, I was a documentary That's and experimental right. now filmmaker. I remember. That's you right. know, yeah. and I had never directed a feature film. I was the producer and the director. I raised all the money. And I had no partnership. Right. And so the partnership really came with the two of you. You know, you guys, you were my producers, you were my partners. Oh, so and um, and that's why we had so much fun. By the way. Yes. That gave me a false idea of how good it could be <laughs> <laughs> in the process of making movies. On a small movie, you, you, I mean, we are more responsible in a way because the money's limited and time's limited. And you can't, you have to take all that seriously on any movie, but the scale of your film was, uh, meant that we had to find resourceful ways. And what was great, what, what Janine was able to do, which was so, you know, Central was fine, not just great locations, but, but also were relatively easy to work in. And she had no money, like all of us, no money to really dress or do anything. But you see the movie and you see what she did to the Mapes Hotel, which sadly isn't there anymore. And that marvelous, marvelous ranch that we shot at and the way it was dressed. Nice, huh? It's lovely. Oh, Walter will take you to your room. Thank you. When you have nothing, your resources are restricted. It's sometimes the most invigorating, it creative. You to be much yes, right. it makes and, uh, and it's a great example of that. I mean, oh. I can't hesitate to say what the budget was. It 800, 600. What? I think it was about eight, eight or nine. Be she's my So we went out to Reno. Janine, of course, ahead of the pack, and you start finding these locations. Now, one of the most incredible things about you is that you have this incredible capacity to bring character into place, you know, and every place. I mean, even, yeah, and even the sofa in the That's ranch house incredible. was such a character itself. I'm, uh, I don't know what I am. I'm not anything, really. It's pair of hands and a familiar face. <laughs> My feeling has always been that since I'm there first, yes. it's my responsibility to set a standard and a tone below which anybody coming behind me will be embarrassed to fall. 
<laughs> I try to make sure it's as strong mm. and as tough and as good as I can make it so that everybody else feels it when they get into the place. Yeah. Uh, I've always thought that that's important. Partially it is because the art department's first. And if we don't set it up comfortably and correctly, everybody coming behind us is going to have an opportunity not to do as good as they could do. I want, I look better if everyone else around me looks better. Right. And that's always been the way I've approached it. So I just decided, all right, I'm, I'm on my own here and drove around myself asking people questions and looking for things. And how we found the ranch was one of those odd moments. Where Somebody I, you ran into on the side of the road or something. I was driving on a dirt road mm. trying to follow some directions that somebody had said, well, if you go here, you might find this, and I think there's something out there. And I was just following all those leads. And I was driving in the dirt road, and I saw this cowboy on a horse on the other side of the fence, just kind of running along. And I rolled down the window, and I shouted at him, and he stopped. But he described to me in detail a ranch that he knew of that he was quite sure I would be interested in after I told him what I wanted. And I just followed his directions and ignore the fact that the gate is closed. He said, just open it up and drive in. There's nobody there is going to shoot you. Hey, Walter, we're here. When I arrived there, I stood there and I, just for a few minutes, without walking around, without trying to find anybody, just stood there and looked at it and felt it. And there was a great poetry that it spoke to me. And I just thought, OK, I'm through looking. This is it. Now I have to go persuade these people <laughs> that we can make this movie on their ranch. The real sign of a location working is when the actors oh. who supposedly live there as their characters right. walk on for the very first time and see that place and walk into their bedroom. Right. their living room, sit on that sofa. And that's the litmus test. That's when you know they it's really, there. really working. It's such an asset um, to have somebody such as yourself who really understands what, um, you know, what happens for all of us when we, when we walk on set. Let's see if I can take it all in in one polite glance. Have a look around. Not every production designer is like that. I'll yes. tell you. It, I when, was, it, when it works, it's amazing because I, it really is. It's, it's not just inspiring, but it, no. it actually informs everything you do. And it really does. It becomes an enormous problem for me if production design has nothing to do with anything but, except design. It was the first time I think I'd had that experience on a movie where I'd walk into a space and it would talk to me in a way that I could see what was had gone into thinking about what was going on. And we had a lot of challenges because we had a lot of night work, we had a lot of materials that had no lighting in it. We had to create everything from ourselves and we had a very limited budget. To actually be able to shoot in a hotel that was called the Mapes Hotel, which is where most of the interiors were done, was a marvelous old, really, I guess it built in the 20s, I think, and it closed. And it was at the time for sale. It was for sale. Yes, it was. Yeah. The one thing I remember is thinking after doing research and talking to you and driving around Reno is identifying that as the building that we absolutely had to be in. And we finally were able to meet with the guy from the bank. And yeah. the bank, I think, owned it at yeah. the time. And he sat there and passively, stone-faced, bored and uninterested, and kept saying he didn't think he was going to be able to let us shoot there because the place was for sale. And he couldn't get beyond that thought. And finally, I remember thinking, I have to break through this somehow. And I just said to him, well, we, how long would the escrow be if you sold it tomorrow? And he said, 90 days. And I said, but we have a 30-day shooting schedule. We will be out of here 
before if you sold it tomorrow anybody could legally take possession of the place so this is a chance for you to defray some of your expenses <laughs> and get a little extra money and I could just see this new thought coming into his head and then he said well okay and then I remember thinking, oh, great, we have a whole empty hotel to no, explore. That's good. That's good. What had happened is that the floors were emptied out of all of the slots and everything. And yep. you found that stuff in a, in a warehouse. I think some it's, of them were in storage yeah. connected to the hotel mm. itself. It didn't go very far away. Was the party <laughs> at the top of the base? Yes. That was at the top of the Because yeah. that was the old nightclub from the yeah. 40s. Yes, it was. Yeah. Well, it that was. was fantastic. I know where the, the chips which we used were all, which I actually stole $500 worth of, were actually housed in a bank because the banker, it may not have been the same one you were dealing with, had been a, um, had worked at the Mapes as a teenager. Uh -huh. And his stories <laughs> of the, that era were extraordinary. He was in the, talking about the late 40s after World War II was when he worked there. Yeah. And they kept the chips in the bank, he told me, because the Mapes might reopen someday, might, yeah. and the chips are actually worth They're money, worth or money. they would be worth money again. Yeah. So they were brought out of a vault, and we used the actual original yeah. Mapes chips. We were told not to, of course, not to steal them, so I immediately So did. you immediately stole them. So immediately it felt but, valuable. But all the people we had as extras had some relationship or it. some association yeah. with the hotel from years before. As I recall, we didn't share the script. Because it was so controversial, right. we pretty much didn't share the script with anybody from whom we were getting location, oh, like right. Bank Guy. As I said, it was just so controversial that we, we didn't feel that would be an asset in terms of getting any kind of help at all. Two, two, up jump the devil, line in. What was the scene or scenes that you felt um, most challenged by or inspired by? Um, I, I remember, well, for example, I remember when we had the conversation about the driving backwards. Okay. Yeah, that now, was, uh, I didn't that was know, hard to figure out. I had out. no idea how you would shoot a scene like that. How would I know? What are you doing out to do It was so simple on these flatbed trucks. The wacky part was we just decided to ignore it, but if, we'd, if she'd actually been driving backwards, mm -hmm. there's no way that she could have reversed direction the way she does in the movie. Of course. She would have come to a stop and change, right. and change gears. And we just decided, ah. It's the movie. It's the movie. It nobody, will, nobody will spot that. It worked. They'd think about it later. And meanwhile, you know, Patricia was, she had a bucket. She was pregnant. She has a bucket. She's throwing up <laughs> every time after, after cut. She's throwing up in the bucket. Uh -huh. Did you have distribution or anything? after you raised the money. Did you have no, any? I didn't sell it until right before Telluride. Mm. Uh, and in fact, uh, when I first started showing it to a select group of distributors, you know, the usual suspects, um, I showed it on tape because Bob Estrin had opened up a cutting room and we were cutting on three quarter. And uh, nobody had ever seen this before. And the reason I got Bob Estrin because nobody wanted to cut on tape. So nobody was using his space. And the result of it, though, one of the results, was uh -huh. that you fell in love, with, and he created all these marvelous transitions uh -huh. between scenes throughout the whole movie, which were these marvelous old-fashioned wipes and lap dissolves and you know, all the things that we associate with two or three generations right. ago, the way people did transition in movies. And they were really wonderfully done throughout the whole film. You were talking about how rarely films are made in this way anymore and mm. even then you know the the smallness the community the intimacy i mean i remember you know fairly clearly back to when we were shooting that love scene um yeah, hotel just, room. Well, yeah that especially it was just yeah, yeah. marty and myself yeah. and you i think and, of the sound man but mm. that scene in particular required that of course in order to work yeah. love scenes are shot many different ways all right, all right. Um, but because this scene was a sexual and emotional scene at the same time, that that development was going at the same time. Well, oftentimes they're not. Yeah, they really aren't about anything. Yeah. Nothing happens except the physical act. Exactly. And, and the scene between the two actors is just that. Yeah. Well, it had to be a scene with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this was unique. It had to play as, uh, you know, an intimate moment between them, but it had to be a, a real scene. What do you think you're doing? waiting for you.
I want you to put on your clothes and leave. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Oftentimes, I'm watching something I've worked on, and I'm not watching it. I don't have the direct experience that an audience would have, because I know what goes on. And I, but also, I'm reacting to things I didn't like when I did them, uh, things I wish I'd done differently, you know, I have to do with lighting or setup or whatever it was. And that happens all the time to me. Right. You know, I'm very rarely having the movie experience that just in a, And I just watch the movie almost in a, like a virgin, you know, like, Oh, like I've totally never seen this movie yeah. Yeah. before, even though it's, and, and I don't know if it's just the distance, maybe that has a lot to do with it, but yeah. And then I was affected emotionally by it. When I sat through Desert Hearts, I thought, wow, this is what movies, when they work, they work. Mm -hmm. And when you care about the people in it, when it's a, a great humanist drama and you're emotionally connected, it isn't just, oh, the lesbian love story movie. It's about human beings and you believe who they are and what they think and feel. Ends up meaning something to you and you connect to it emotionally. That's all you can ever wish for. The other thing it was, which doesn't happen much anymore either, is the whole movie company essentially lived together. We all moved into this wonderful little motel in Reno, which also wasn't there anymore, and took the whole place over. Yeah, yeah. Every room and the swimming pool in the middle and it was kind of like probably what it was like going on location in the 30s and 40s in Hollywood, yeah. where okay. the whole movie company would go someplace. That's one of the things I remember really yeah. strongly about it. So yeah. I keep thinking, gee, I wish we could yeah. it go do the like same that. thing yeah. now, but we don't. Yeah. Watching dailies together yeah. at night. It, it was a family because yeah. of that. I mean, is there any movie I would go back and kind of mumble about like 20 or 30 years later? And, have, <laughs> and, and really there isn't, except maybe this one, I think maybe one or two others. You, know, you, you have the great good fortune of having a wonderful cast and Patricia and, and Ellen. But actors now, it's all about negotiating mm. with the company to spend the least amount mm -hmm. of time you possibly can on location yeah. working. It's all about not being there for as, <laughs> or being there for as little as you possibly can be there. And it, it happens all the time in movies. Nobody, I think the only other experience I've ever had that's like mm -hmm. yours is with Paul Thomas Anderson because we all sort of go on location, we all go off together and live, relatively speaking, in the same place and the cast is there mm. the whole time. But nobody does that. Nobody does that and nobody has the same feeling. Um, it's, it is like a theater company. You feel like you're part of a family. Yeah. And at the end of the show, it's very <clears throat> sad. And it was very sad. It was sad, family. but there was so much um, uh, collaboration and yeah. I was getting to do the thing I most wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, yeah. and that was just so much fun. For me, it wasn't just a nice job with good people in an interesting place. What each person carries off from the film is not just the stories about the film, there are the personal things that happen to you on the way that get added on top of the story and the experience of the togetherness as well. You know, to start your career on something that's that, much of it, not just an enjoyable experience, but a kind of profoundly emotional experience working with the group of people that you become very close friends with. It doesn't happen that often. And so you do remember those things. And, uh, you know, I have you to thank for that. And that is such a giant compliment. Well, it's all <laughs> no, true. It is, because process, yeah. you know, yeah. is, is as important as it is. result. It is. Because process lives with us. And it's something that we may not be sharing, like the result, the movie itself, right. with others. And that's, that's part of, um, mm -hmm. you know, obviously why we're sitting here, you know, talking today. Right. No, I, and it was a real gift that I didn't appreciate yeah. enough at the time. I need to find someone that's mine. I've been so lonely. I've tried to find.